I don't know who you are, but welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. And you're very welcome to episode 142 of the Irish Photography Podcast. My name is Darren. I'm your host this morning. So I'm actually recording during the morning. And normally I record in the evening, but I've got somebody with me who I'm very, very happy to have back on the podcast. It's been a couple of years since he's been on. And without any further ado, welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast, Maz Peter Everson. How are you, buddy? Thank you so much. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working, working, working. Right now I'm in a period of, of moving from our apartment and then onto a house where we will live for at least a year. Um, and then nice. I just do a lot of photography. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And it's interesting because, like I said, you know, it's around two years, I think, since you were on last on with us. And actually, you know, if somebody wants to kind of go back and listen to that episode, I put a link into the description rather than going where you started out, because it was a fascinating story how your photography journey started and evolved. But even since you've been on in the last couple of years, you know, it's been incredible just to watch your journey and to see the different things that you've been doing. And I'm really looking forward to finding out more about how did you deal with the different things in the last two years, particularly in the last year, everybody obviously had yeah. to deal with, but then, you know, how your own photography as well has improved and how you feel that your photography has evolved. And maybe actually, you know, let's start with that question. How do you think your photography has evolved over the last couple of years? How has it changed? I think I, I have, I guess there's this saying in, in landscape photography that we all start out by photographing big epic vistas. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, we kind of diverge into like different subgenres. Uh, some go more into the abstract stuff, while others maybe go into some more black and white. Some mm -hmm. go into only woodland photography. And I think that since we are talking about the past two years, I have definitely uh, found out that I really love photographing in woodlands and not mm. necessarily like big epic woodlands like the red woods in, in the US, even though they are impressive. Uh, but, but even so, just like in my own neighborhood and literally in my own neighborhood, like a few kilometers from where I've grown up, where I've lived. Uh, so I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have that kind of diverged. Well, I have different things I like to do. I still love photographing the big epic vistas from Iceland and the Faroe Islands. Um, but then I also really enjoy photographing, I wouldn't say the intimate details, but more the more calm landscapes that I have here in Denmark. And I enjoy both things. Um, mm -hmm. And by doing both things, I would say I, I kind of like, when I get a little bit tired of photographing big epic vistas, I can always do the other stuff. And then when I get a little bit tired of, of photographing the more calm scenes, I can go back and photograph the big epic vistas. So in that way, um, I'm not like burning out. Mm. And isn't it good to be able to have that skill set now as well? Because like if you go back a couple of years in your photography journey, as you say, you know, it's the big open vista, it's the big impactful scene but even an intimate scene can be equally as impactful to, to the viewer's Absolutely. eye you know and that, that's yeah. where you can overlook something and go ah that was never hang on there's a lot for me to discover here and just following your journey and even those examples of woodland you know you have some phenomenal there's one particular photograph that you've gotten in woodland and it's just incredible i mean it's the wild garlic you've got perfect light everything else that's not a big wide open vista, but it's an absolutely gorgeous image. It's incredible. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, do, do you think that that will still continue to evolve as the years will go on? Will you find that you might even be getting into kind of uh, macro to, for all, all intents and purposes, really, really up close? So to go from the big open vista to the closer scene to the intimate scene, do you think that you might even go into the, the finite details at some stage on that? I hope so. Uh, it's always nice to to become passionate about something else. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, right now, the, the the big passion is definitely photographing Denmark from a more, um, dare I say, natural or realistic point mm-hmm. of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, I kind of feel that when I go to Iceland and the Faroe Islands, I get into this fantasy universe because mm-hmm. it's so foreign to me. It's very exotic. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I go to England or Britain or even Ireland, mm-hmm. I would go into something which inspires me from a fantasy universe or from a historical point of view. Um, whereas photographing in Denmark, because I am used to it, it's my backyard. Mm-hmm. I have a tendency to prefer to photograph it and edit it in a way which is more realistic to look mm-hmm. at. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas I don't really care too much about realism when it comes to my travel photography. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that that's an interesting um, observation I've done about myself and, and how I edit my stuff. Mm. Mm. So more I'm not sure that, comes... I, that answered the question. <laughs> I think I, th- I think it kind of does because you know when you think about the areas that you're going to, you're going with a different approach. So like I was going to say, mm. there's Mordor will come with you when you're going traveling from the Lord of the Rings influence, and you'll kind of bring yeah. that. Whereas on your local area, you know, let's just talk about some recent videos that you might have released for argument's sake and say cornfields. Okay, you could yeah. apply some sort of you know fantasy world in relation to that, but at the same point, you don't really need to for what you're trying to get out from the scene and. Exactly. You know, yeah, and I think like even looking at your images um, from Iceland, example, um, and uh, geez, the name has gone from me now. It was there a second ago. Um, the Faroe Islands, England. No, no, no. In in, in Iceland, um, oh. you've got the beach. You've got the the, the mountain range on the beach, and you got yeah, the reflections. Westerhorn. That's that's it. Yeah. So yeah. when you look at that, you know that is that strikes you as impressive. Number one. Yeah, it strikes you as like, wow, look at this. What could I do with this scene? What could I create with this scene? Mm. And it is otherworldly. So the location, I'm sure, can actually make you think differently on how you're going to approach the shot, and then you get Absolutely. a different and you get a different edit after that. You know, yeah. the next step, the next step, I suppose, to kind of find something intimate in in the bigger landscape in Iceland and Faroes, and then that's when you know that you've got the full spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing is, with, with especially my recent Iceland photos, I haven't actually been to Iceland for the past one and a half years. Mm-hmm. Like, time flies. Yeah, I know. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's not that I would say that I in any way, shape or form over-process my photos. For, for me, at least my editing phase, what I've found that I prefer over the past years is that even though I might add a lot of contrast um, and I rarely swap skies, I really rarely do that these days, but th- th- there's this thing that I always want to respect the light. Um, yes. If, if, if the, the light seems off, then it seems unrealistic. And that's very interesting, I suppose, Maz, in relation to it, because, you know, a journey is about evolution. A journey is about learning and a journey is about playing the different things that we've done to the different styles, to the different scenes and such like that. And, you know, since you were last on, you have done something which is quite impressive. You've released your own ebooks, which are a fantastic body of work to be able to have people to number one to refer to, but also to learn from and to get inside your head. Tell us a bit more about uh, these books and where people can find them. Yeah, so so uh, yeah, they can find them through my homepage. Um, okay. Links everywhere and through my videos. Uh, but the idea about these ebooks were that when I get an ebook or, or a regular photo book, there's just so much text in them. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, ha- ha- I'm an academic myself. Like my background is educational philosophy and I took a master's degree in that. And when you spend so much time uh, reading like the old philosophers, uh, like Immanuel Kant and his polygomena stuff, like you, it, it's impressive that his ideas even came out mm-hmm. because it is just next to nearly impossible to read for a modern day human being. Um, so, so I really wanted to, get my ideas about how I compose a scene out there in the simplest possible way. So minimal text, but enough text, and then a lot of photos uh, to get the point across. And 
simply just to make it as easy to understand as possible, each chapter has like one theme. And then in the final chapter, I kind of put it all together. And I made two of those ebooks with different themes, but everything about composition. And I think composition as as tools you can use. There's this tendency to call it the rule of thirds or the mm-hmm. golden ratio, the golden mm-hmm. rule or whatever they call it. Um, but I, I like to change it to tools instead of rules because it's something you can apply in the field. You can look for all these shapes and patterns in the field and then you can build up your photo when you take it using composition as a tool to show what it is you want to show or tell the story you want to tell or yeah, whatever your purpose of your photos uh, are. But, and you know what? It makes sense when you when you think about it because you know you're making a book for a visual person, which is a photographer. So mm. surely it should match the visual n- need to learn, as opposed to reading it on a page and saying, "Okay, this is when you do this." To, no, hang on a second, I'm going to forget that. Whereas if you've actually mm. got a visual reference, that's what will stick in somebody's head when they're out and about and going, "Hang on, what? Was, oh, there it is." Or again, it's an ebook. Open it up on your phone when you're out and about, and you can also take the lessons and learnings with you as well, quickly, as exactly. opposed to well, which chapter was this, which paragraph was that, what word was this? It you're, was I think something you're... I thought about when I wrote uh, the ebooks, but I've heard a lot of people saying that that is actually how they use them in the field mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. to to get both inspiration, but also to see oh the, this is what he meant, and and then they can go out and kind of do the same thing. Uh, in another location so uh, that is a very nice bonus that i, I wasn't <laughs> aware of when i wrote mm. them but a, and a nice way to use them oh for sure and you know what i think you know when people actually learn learn by doing okay you can learn yeah. from a book fine but you never even know what's going to be happening outside when you actually go to put something into practice but learn yeah, by doing definitely. yeah and learn by doing with with visual references i think is probably the most powerful aspect of it because yeah. yes as you say you know you've got your rules okay you change that concept to tools which is absolutely spot on because yeah. rules aren't really rules we kind of bend the rules we go left we go right we go up we go down if it looks right it is right but if you've got a yeah. basis to form which is a foundation then you are going to end up with a more powerful more compelling more storytelling image and i think that's yeah. where you know, what you've hit on, I think, is absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, I, I, I watch your videos. I think I watch every single one of your videos, to be honest with you. Um, and I often comment because I know you mentioned in relation to it, you know, I don't mind. Just leave a comment. And, you know, even if you had something for breakfast and I often I, I'd orange yep. juice or whatever it may be, because whatever you know, works on the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But when I'm watching the videos, I can see you put those things into practice in real world examples. Mm. And, you know, I'm I'm on the same page as you. I think composition is very, very, very powerful. Now, some people out there, they think that light is more powerful. But I would argue me, they're, 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 they're dependent on each other. Exactly. Because, like, you could have a beautiful composition and bad light and still a great image. Mm. But you could have great light and a bad composition, and that's not a good image. So, yeah. You, 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 and you've said that, again, again on your channel and even on the, on the e-books and the learnings and such like that is, you want the, the viewer's eye to travel through the image. If they're mm. stopped at something, and if there's something that brings them out of the image, then the eye has been drawn away from where it should be gone. Now, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong here, but we are drawn to light. So we will look at the brightest part of the image. So if the brightest part of the image is something that isn't appealing, then you have to compose the image to make it compelling in that way, because light isn't going to be. Yeah, enough I, I would argue because I, I I have found that over the years, um, it can be a little bit misleading to say that we are drawn towards the brightest part of the photo. I would okay. say we are drawn towards the highest contrast part of the photo, okay. um, because if if our photo is high key. Uh, photo then obviously the background or, or whatever is bright it is not really where our eyes will go it will go to the subject which is probably darker than the background gotcha. um, yeah so 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 in that way we can also be brought towards uh, it's whatever stands out really that mm. our eyes have a tendency to go to that is often the light or the brighter part because the surroundings can can, can be dark um, but yeah, 
so if, if you're shooting up towards the sky and there's a balloon in the sky, obviously your eye will go to the balloon, but it is probably right. darker than the surroundings. Mm. So, so yeah, it, it be a little bit careful about saying that your eye is drawn towards the bright part. Good I would point, say yeah. it's drawn towards the high contrast part, whatever stands out in the photo. And a perfect example is one of your images from the pharaohs where you're walking and you've got this layer upon layer upon layer of light in the background. Yeah. And I'm drawn to the figure which is walking along the cliff. That's yeah. your example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, very, very good example. And you know what? I suppose we've spoken there briefly in relation to your YouTube channel. So your YouTube channel has gone from strength to strength. And I think, you know, it is something that is a f fascinating journey for me because I know I mean, we've been speaking with each other for a number of years now and I've been able to mm. see your channel growing. And before we started recording, I went, it's gone and it's gone like this. And you're going, well, has it? It's kind of a more of a gradual thing because you're living it on a regular basis. So tell me, how has your YouTube journey been in the last couple of years since we were since since we last spoke on the podcast? Very enlightening. Okay. <laughs> um, ah, YouTube, it, it, YouTube is a funny thing because us landscape photographers, or humans in general, we put a lot of value into a lot of different things, and to run a YouTube channel, it, it's such a balancing act between human psychology authenticity mm -hmm. and value in your videos mm -hmm. um, and also what is entertaining for people um, you you can put a lot of value into a youtube video but if if you're a person who can't get the information out in a way that is interesting then people are probably going to click away from it and when people click away from your youtube videos it shows the algorithm then it, that it's not an interesting video. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you can be a super entertaining person, but in the long run, if you're not providing any kind of value or at least entertainment, um, then people are probably also going to click away from it. So there's so many factors that you need to think about based on also what audience you want, uh, what do people expect of you, um yeah so so yeah you, youtube is is such a study in human psychology and <laughs> behavior because you can mm -hmm. have a common field who's saying one thing yet the statistics show a completely other thing yeah. like uh, yeah. people are saying like oh you don't need to make uh, attention grabbing titles or thumbnails or whatever okay i don't do that and then the videos just die within a few minutes mm -hmm. it, it's just how it is uh, mm -hmm. and, and it takes a long time to just accept that that is how it is um that's the thing i i hear people within the landscape photography community that if they started a youtube channel they would do it in a completely other way and they start out and then four weeks later five tips to get the best photos from your gear yeah. something like that right it's yeah i wish i wish that i could just say photography blog 142 yeah and then everybody would come running and and, and watching it but it's just not how it works and and it's how it is not just in social media it's how it has always been in media we are drawn to interesting uh, titles in newspapers mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. magazines beautiful pictures and, and we are in an attention economy there's no doubt about it that's what everybody who's in the entrepreneurial yes. uh, lifestyle yeah. knows it's attention economy and it's about grabbing people's attention because we are getting bombarded with information out there all the time. And you can see as soon as you stop using these fairly basic psychological, I won't call them tricks, but maybe techniques mm -hmm. of grabbing people's attention, then you will get less attention. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of changes all the time. Also, there's different trends and you have to keep being on top of that all the time when you're running a YouTube channel. And yeah, it, it's frustrating for us YouTube content creators because 
we hopefully believe that people who subscribe to our channel find whatever it is we're doing interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they're, they, they stick to it, see a few videos, and then their life goes on. Yes. <laughs> and and yeah, it's, yeah. it is what it is. So you, I think it's fairly common that most YouTube channels, it's only 50% of their subscribers who actually watch the videos. Uh, and then the other 50% is uh, transient. Yeah, yeah it's, it's people who are not subscribed. Mm. And and so that is also like a thing which is like, what? But apparently it's like that for everybody. So it's probably how you the YouTube algorithm push out the video for, for each one who actually clicks the video from your subscribers. They try to push it on to someone else. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, like the YouTube algorithm is, is hidden, uh, but there are definitely things that youtube are all about you have to do this and this and this and then we will promote your video okay yeah so and it, i, I it, do, do you think i suppose you know you've, you've said a number of things there which kind of throw a number of questions to me right um do yeah. you think that you change for youtube because you want to be able to find get your videos spotted on youtube as you say you know very quickly you got to put something okay five ways to get the best out of your 16 35 lens okay mm. that's beneficial that's quick. It's headline grabbing, and I know exactly what I'm expecting to get in within the video when yeah. I press when I press play. And then on the flip side to that is, you say, okay, you'd love to be able to make a video which is vlog number 142. That's it, no more. <laughs> but when you've got that split second of the somebody who's going to get a flash of this thumbnail up on their whatever their feed and their phone or their tablet or their computer, mm. you kind of, as you said there's nothing new for youtube here this is like newspapers this is headlines you know yeah. back in the day before uh, there was newsstands and stores you had people selling papers on the street and they were shouting the headline to grab the attention exactly. to go there's the news go read it and i think youtube is pretty much exactly the same as that so like do you find that you kind of have to kind of go around that in in, in that mindset to say this is what i want to achieve this is how i need to present it this is how somebody is going to be able to see it and then you got to do all the things, as I know myself, on the background of YouTube to make sure that you get all these things done so that YouTube picks it up. So it's a lot of work, but it's quite rewarding, I imagine, then when you nail something because the feedback is, wow, Maz, thank you so much for this. I've learned so much. Thank you for that. I've learned. I never thought of this or whatever it may have been. So yeah, you are, you're kind of evolving, but you're evolving for the good of your audience, I think, more so, yeah? Yeah, it, it definitely. Uh, it it's really really rewarding when you see something that uh, takes off and and people are very happy about the product that you are, you have presented. And you're absolutely right that there there isn't many ways like a checklist of things that you need to think about when you do your YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. um, and, and well, I'm not sure how many YouTube videos I've made by now, 250, 300, or something like that. Um, so you kind of get used to that way of thinking. Um, and in regard to it, does it change me and my approach to things? It's something I'm thinking very much about and I'm very aware about. And I try not to make it change my photos. Okay. I don't care too much about how I build up the video in and of itself. For me, the photos have always been the biggest priority and I can always build, I've found that I can usually build an interesting video around a photo, no matter if it's a Milky Way photo, it's a Northern Lights photo, or if it's a calm woodland photo. Gotcha. Um, but again, there, there is like a checklist. I try to make sure that whatever it is I'm putting into the video or what it is I'm doing is something that I find interesting. If I don't find it interesting, then I scratch it. So I, I, I see my work as, yeah, is this actually interesting for myself to do? If it is, check. Is this a video that will do well on YouTube? If it's not, uh, okay, how can I change the factors for me to actually enjoy going out and doing mm -hmm. that YouTube video. Mm -hmm. the, the, the biggest struggle I think for all YouTubers is finding a title and a thumbnail, which makes people actually click the video because I am confident that my videos are of such a quality uh, that they will look through it and enjoy mm -hmm. it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then it's just about figuring out uh, how, how to actually present it so that people want to, to click on it. <laughs> because if they don't <laughs> click on it, they don't watch it. Um, yeah, yeah, and, for and sure. And that is where I, 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 I sadly had to... Uh, I, I started my series there called uh, Tales from the Forest. Mm-hmm. And it just performed worse and worse and worse. And wow. I even started making a series where called Photographing Denmark. Uh, where I wanted to put it into this series format so that people, this is the start, and then there's different episodes through it. Mm-hmm. But it, un, unless I, I make an interesting title, then people are just not watching it. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, you want to have your videos out there. You want to show your photos. That's kind of the point of having a youtube channel also it's my living yeah. my income yeah. depend on it yeah so if i only get ten thousand views from a video versus like a magnitude of a hundred thousand i can see it on my monthly uh, salary yes. i can yeah. definitely see it. Um, yeah. so so on the one hand yes it is what it is like the happy amateur doesn't have to think about all these factors but when mm-hmm. your income depends on it it is something you need to think about. Mm. And if you don't want to like, you know, burn out, you need to be very self-aware about what is actually interesting for you to mm-hmm. photograph and to mm-hmm. video. Um, I'm, I'm watching some of the other YouTubers and landscape photographers. And it's interesting. Let's just take Thomas Eaton for, for an example. Like he says, he constantly struggled during summer. Yeah. And it's the worst time of year for him to photograph. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love the photographing uh, during summer and especially here in, in like August and September before autumn color mm-hmm. sets in. That, that's my favorite time of year to photograph. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a good chance of photographing the Milky Way. It's dark enough for that. It looks beautiful. Uh, we get a lot of fog in the mornings. Um, I don't get that overly dramatic forest uh, color with, with the orange, orange mm-hmm. and, and yellows and reds. It is much more calm. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I just prefer that. And then we have heather, of course, lots of heather. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and for me, that, that is my favorite time of year to photograph, most definitely. And you know, you've again, you've mentioned a couple of things there, which drop a number of questions. I won't go into all of the questions that came to my mind in relation to it, but one, I suppose, is this: um, you've got the different seasons, of course, and we mm-hmm. all have our favorite season that we like to take photographs during or on. Um, the challenge I have with summer, from my own personal point of view, is I'm a seascape photographer, and that's it. I mean, okay, mm. I'm a landscape photographer, but I, I I prefer to be by the sea. That's where my heart and my home is. Yeah. The sea, typically, you get calm conditions. So you don't get much movement in the water. So you are kind of limited to what you can do from an action point of view. So you you say, hmm. okay, I keep my eye out in the weather and I look if there's going to be swells in the Atlantic. And yet there is, okay, there's a four meter swell. I'm there because it breaks yeah. from the norm. But you also have to find areas that you enjoy to go taking photographs in. And like, you know, the, the woods for me in the summertime, it's just too green, okay? Um, yeah. But there's still things that you can take for. I learned this last year in the first lockdown that I, I was forced into going to a woods, which is just over here. It's 100 meters mm-hmm. from my home. And I'd never really gone in there with the camera before. But when you're forced into something, you always find something. There's always going to be some type of photograph. But I think the dichotomy there is, do I like this photograph? Yes. Will my audience like this photograph? Maybe. Okay, does it deserve a video? When the reality of the situation is, in my, in my opinion, anyway, and I think similar to you from what you said, but it's about getting out. It's about getting the practice. It's about just trying yeah. your hand at something different. It doesn't always have to be a banger. It's about telling no. the story. You know, it's about telling the journey that you've gone on. And that's something that yeah. I'm one of those happy amateurs. I mean, I, my, I, I've got my YouTube channel, but I do it because it's a passion mm. project for me. But yeah. I do know that if I was in your shoes, I would say, okay, am I going to do something for me or am I going to do something that is actually going to get somebody watching which is effectively going to turn into revenue Mm. and if you don't release and i think this is what thomas was mentioning is that if you don't release on a consistent basis and you have that gap then the algorithm goes okay no content from this you're back down and you have to build yourself back up again and i think that's where the challenge is you know so it's it's kind of putting the pressure i made a video about this back in i don't know how long ago on my own channel about is youtube pressure a good thing because Mm. 
you need everybody needs something to kind of give them the 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 the, the kick in the backside to keep them going, keep them going. Yeah. <laughs> right? Why, one one from your point of view could be okay. If I don't keep going, then I have no money, so I have to make sure that I'm keeping my revenue going. The other it side does is help that... to get out and 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 get those photos. Like exactly. Summer mornings, it can be hard to to get up at this yeah. time of year out of bed yeah. in the mornings. Like getting up at five, it's not fun. It never was, <laughs> but. When you're out, when you've just like, you know, if you haven't gone to bed at like two in the night, but maybe a little bit earlier than usual, um, when you're actually out there and mm. the only thing you can hear are the birds yeah, and all other sounds are completely suppressed because it's foggy, that is absolutely magical. Yeah, And I love it each time. Yeah, I may be tired the rest of the day, but you know, I'm, I'm just sitting and, and editing a few photos anyway. So mm-hmm. it's not like I have to be super up on top all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so yeah, making those YouTube videos, I, ha- I have a YouTube video coming in a few weeks where I got up early in the morning uh, because I wanted to catch this morning fog. And it was just, it was such a small scene but it was very, very close to where I've grown up. So the photos I got from there, already now, one of them will probably be my favorite photo wow. of the year. One wow. of them. And it was such a simple scene. Just some trees and then some background fog. Uh, and yeah, you know, it, that's what it takes. Like, I don't Absolutely. need to travel to get those photos. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, so if it hadn't been for YouTube, I would probably not have gone out at that time. So and, I don't know. And that, I, I, <laughs> I'm and also you know lazy. That, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very good point because, you know, you need that something to push you to do it. But by doing it in the very nature, you are going to get a photograph. Like I say, it's not going to be yeah. a banger, but it's going to be a shot. You might have learned something yeah. from that. And there's also your audience will also learn something saying, you know mm-hmm. what, like, you don't have to have the ideal conditions. Yes, it's it's lovely to have the ideal conditions. You don't have to have the ideal location. Yes, it's lovely to have mm. the ideal location. But every step of the way, when you're using that camera, you're improving. And you are going to yeah. get some bit of an improvement from the last time that you went out. You mm-hmm. might have learned how to deal with the light differently. You might have yeah. learned you know, about composition and such like that. And a very good example, actually, is you for the last year and a half with Denmark. So, yeah. you know... You, I think, have rediscovered Denmark in your own eyes, I think, in it by watching um, your, your channel and such like that. Like, how has that surprised you? How much has Denmark surprised you in the last year and a half for the actual opportunities for photography that were always there, but you weren't looking at them? Um, yeah, but that's the thing. I'm, I'm not sure... Uh, I was actually looking at them. <laughs> the, the thing is that most of the places where I've gone in Denmark, uh, I, I've showed it them in, in my later videos. We just have like fields upon fields upon fields, so much farmland. And if you look mm-hmm. on, on, on Google Maps and, and look at especially Jutland, where I'm from, the peninsula there, it, it's, uh, it's just farmland <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. But, yeah. but as soon as you start to explore we also have many small forests here and there and most scenes like when when we point our camera towards something that is the only one thing you see and even though denmark is a small country there are a lot of square kilometers to explore Mm -hmm. still Mm -hmm. so it's about finding all those small precious scenes that that really stands out Mm. and you can always start like you know searching for like the the most touristy places or the famous nature places Uh, yeah and 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 that was how i found some of those like very gnarly uh, beach trees Mm. Mm -hmm. apparently it it it's it's not a famous place but it's part of a semi-famous trail i didn't know about it and i wasn't even walking on that trail I was in another part of the forest and I was just like, okay, what's down here? And I went down there and I just thought, whoa, this is the most amazing place I've ever seen, yeah. uh, at least in Denmark. And <laughs> yeah. I, I later Googled it and I was like, it's not like a hidden place at all. Uh, there are plenty of people walk, walks there, but I actually did find it on my own, but just by like, you know, exploring. Uh, 
and 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 that's the thing like i i have been driving around quite a lot in these farmland areas and suddenly you're just like oh there's a tower i didn't know about that it's only like 20 <laughs> minutes from where i live never heard about it <laughs> beautiful photos from there yeah. so so well, one of the things i i made a video like last year about how to find uh, new places and research your own backyard uh, one thing is if you're going going from where you live and then maybe you want to visit your parents or you want to visit your kids or something like that instead of going on the road you always go on mm -hmm. just take the side roads just a little detour mm -hmm. and you may go out on on places that you have never driven before and you see something which nobody's ever heard about because <laughs> the landscape photography genre yeah it's just so niche like mm -hmm. nobody uh, outside of our little bubble here cares whatsoever yeah. about landscape <laughs> photography <laughs> yeah it's like my family don't even know what that triangular mountain in in iceland <laughs> the famous one there yeah kirkjufell uh, yeah yeah known for but but it's yeah so you you can probably find something in your neighborhood but by just doing these small detours yeah I think so. And, you know, the last question I have before I go for break is that what actually does is you and I were messaging a couple, well, maybe on six or seven months ago about having a list and having different things where you want to go and adding things to different areas and such like mm. that. And that's a perfect example of you driving along the road and taking note and going, OK, in the book for when I get the right conditions, this is a place I'm going to return to. Yeah. And these are areas that you may not even ever have considered because you stick on the motorway, you're going on that journey. Yeah. Yet, you know, uh, whatever, two kilometers over here on the right down a, down a curvy road is the most beautiful mm. tree that's sitting on a hill that has some great farmland in front of it that can lead to some incredible shots. But you would have driven past them, as you say, if you stuck on the, the motorway. So a question for you on that, you know, how long is your list now? Have you got a lot, a lot of areas that you've discovered that you want to go back to, to the to the optimum conditions yeah I, I know the we are making this as a video but it's also audio format but I, <laughs> I i think the the best thing i can actually do is show you my map of denmark and, okay. and how many uh yeah pinpoints you have. i have on that because it's it's just that's a lot you know so let's see here Wow. <laughs> and that is only a little a little section right so <laughs> that's yeah, incredible. it's not like i'm running out of places to go and photograph <laughs> yeah you have <laughs> a lot now, that's for sure yeah yeah i'm just yeah. waiting for it to be like a beautiful foggy morning and then get out again mm, fantastic well look i'm looking forward to seeing those mm. images and those videos when you get back to those right conditions what i'm going to do right now is it's fascinating first uh, part i'm going to take a very very quick break and i want to come back i've got some further detailed questions I want to get some more information on so yeah we'll be right back after this if you're enjoying this episode of the podcast why not jump over to iTunes or Spotify and listen to the back catalogue that we have with some great episodes where we talk about photography gear and some excellent guests along the way thanks very much for listening and for watching we'll see you on the next one you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast so Maz you know thank you very much for some fantastic insights into the first part of the podcast um i kind of want to go into a couple of more details really on the things that i've observed of you since again you were last on a couple of years back and you've been involved as a judge in a number of different competitions since then so how tell me a bit more about this and how the experiences and such like that how was it yeah so it, it's a, a very interesting process because you also learn a lot about your own photography from looking at these photos and judging other people's photos um, one was in uh, Nigel Lanson's uh, mm -hmm. big, by now, with, fairly with an, big. With an, an Irishman who won it, Felix. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it was an absolutely gobsmackingly beautiful photo. I didn't uh, judge here in, in the second uh, season, I don't know, second competition. And uh, Nigel yeah. wanted like a set of, of new judges. So it wasn't the same ones all the time. Uh -huh. um, but I, I was judging the first one and it was is so interesting um, exactly because you are like, what is it that you actually see? What is it you as a judge connect to? Obviously, we have 
all these different things is light okay are the highlights blown does it actually matter if they are blown mm -hmm. and all those parameters that that you use um but for the most part you you can easily see if it's a good or bad photo like within like 0.2 seconds of you seeing it for the first time mm -hmm. uh, when when you have to go through like 10,000 photos you become very very fast and be like is this something that is worth looking at or not mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah and and on, on on the other hand that may be a little bit of a bad thing because maybe some photos do take a longer time to appreciate um, but yeah, I, I think uh, I think that is just how it is with the photography contests. I think it is, and you, you know what? When you mentioned here about an image, you know, it's very similar to the headlines. You know, it either grabs mm -hmm. you and you want to discover more, or it's just something that you pass over and say, "Okay, I go to yeah. the next one." And I think yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Did you find when you were looking at different people's images, did you say it kind of helps you to improve because you kind of way, you know what? You, you can relate that to your own images and say, okay, mm -hmm. hang on a second. If I want to have an image that somebody wants to do this, maybe I need to think slightly differently and not have that same challenge that this particular photographer may have had from that image. So um, yeah. was it, was your own personal preferences and style, do you think, influenced by what you saw or was your own personal preference and style influencing you and in what you were looking or what you were seeing within the image to kind of correlate the two together? Or was it totally it different images? Ways. I think okay. it goes both ways because obviously when I make my photos, I, I want to respect the light. So if I see some editing process where the light is just weird, totally mm -hmm. off, mm -hmm. um, you can usually see if it's special and uncommon light, but that is just what the photo is because it's very hard to fake real light in Photoshop. Like we can always add uh, flares and stuff, uh, but how light interacts with leaves uh, or, or wheat fields or mm -hmm. mountains and, and, and how it casts the shadows, it is next to nearly impossible to fake that in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. uh, you need some 3D rendering programs to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so... For the most part, if if the if the light looks unrealistic for me, it's just out. Like mm -hmm. I don't care how much of a fantasy world it is, or how exotic the place is. But if the mm -hmm. light looks weird, mm -hmm. for me, mm -hmm. it's just a complete turn off. And that is definitely something I am uh, very aware of in in my own photography. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then there's also like I. Don't for the for the most part I don't really mind uh, it being from like iconic locations. It's not something I find to be a, a, a problem. I know a lot of uh, landscape photographers uh, uh, prefer that the location is very unique and mm -hmm. very original. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, you know, like in five thousand years, when everybody loves landscape photography, there's only so many unique places back left on Earth. So yeah. I can't yeah. really discard uh, photographs because they're from iconic locations. We go to iconic locations because we enjoy them. We go to Paris because we want to see the Eiffel Tower. Like it, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why we travel. Yes. Um, uh, but but yeah. I, but but I also appreciate when it is from an uncommon place. So mm. yeah, you know, it can go both ways. But it's it's usually down to like subject, how it behaves, how the lighting is. Is it something like whoa? this is just amazing uh, mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. and then of course we uh, in, in both Nigel's but also the other photography competition I've judged uh, we the final photos we are asking for raw photos and there was mm -hmm. actually a photo that made it all the way to I think almost third place in the one I judged with Nigel um, because it was just so special and there okay. we asked for the raw photo and it was just so edited uh, uh, that we we had to disregard it because everything what was so interesting about that photo was stretched a bit too far for us to accept it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And 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 that, that 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 was yeah 
too bad, but it is what it is. And and it comes down to the different uh, competition rules. Uh, yes. And and obviously, as a judge, you need to have that in mind too. What is it that we are actually judging? Like, is manipulation okay? In that case, mm-hmm. fine. Then we accept it. If it's not, if we're going for something completely natural, then of course you have to disregard those that are heavily uh, edited. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And did you find when you were looking at some images that it was a place that you had been to, but you never saw an image of a similar composition? And that's exactly the uniqueness. I think you can go to an iconic area. You can take the iconic shot. It's beautiful for a reason. Absolutely. Yeah. But it, it's, it's you know, go 50 meters to the left or 50 meters yeah. to the right or back or forward, and you'll get a completely mm-hmm. different shot. So was there a couple of images that you found on that? You're going, geez, I couldn't believe that that was actually this place because the composition might have been so strong or at the same point you could look at an image and go if you'd only gone two feet to the left (laughs) that would have been such a more powerful image so i think that's probably where your experience will come into it and particularly from the composition point of view as well because it is vitally important that tiny bit of a move six inches to the left will completely transform an image yeah, obviously you 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 learn to see potential in different photos. If the light has just been like this, or it has just been like if it just moved, yeah, as you said, a, a few centimeters to the right or pan to the camera a little bit to the left, yeah. then it would have been a little bit stronger. But then again, you don't know as a judge what's actually just outside the frame. Maybe mm-hmm. there may be a really good reason why the photographer cropped it the way he did. So mm-hmm. it it. Yeah, we can see potential and stuff, but maybe it's simply just not possible. I find that uh, often to be the case with my own photography. When I guess get less than completely optimal photos, it's usually because I have to compromise something in the field. Mm-hmm. And then it is what it is. Like my pers- my own photos are very polished. They're very clean, minimal. I try to avoid every kind of distraction that I can. Mm-hmm. Um but there is also something about making less than perfectly optimized photos mm-hmm. because it, it, it is hard to, to really get those super polished photos uh, in, in the field. There's some realism to that that you can definitely appreciate. So I know Ben Horn has, uh, has a video about that. Uh, it's not mm-hmm. something I have dived too much into, um, but that's because I'm just... I'm so graphical in in the way I think, mathematical mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. really so much about composition and the structure of the photo. So I can almost not not do it. Like if I don't <laughs> make my optimal composition, it is like you know that thing that keeps scratching on the back. If I had yeah. just done a little bit different, yeah. so that is why I usually always cover my butt when I'm in the field and take a lot of different small adjustments Weeks. in the field yeah. when I compose the photos because I never know exactly what I wanted before I come home back home and then and I see it on a bigger screen. And I think the other side as well is that, you know, the conditions will also dictate the type of image that you have to take because if the light's mm-hmm. in a certain area, then you have to have the camera in a certain area. And like, yeah. you know, we mentioned there a second ago in relation to, you know, going to Paris, for example. You go to Paris because mm-hmm. you know the Eiffel Tower is going to be there. You know it's going to look well. You know it's going to be a nice whatever scene to look at our photograph yeah. for for me you know the sea is something that i love because every photo is unique because your wave mm. is going to be in a different position it's going to flow differently and an image of yours actually i think it was at an besterhorn i think when you were on a trip with nigel actually and there's an image that you've taken there you were on the rocks and there's a breaking wave it's coming in over the top of it the dynamicness of the image is incredible you've got this mountain range in the background but it's the wave is what really drags me into that image. And that's why mm. I think about utilizing the conditions, utilizing the scene and using yeah. the actual water as part of your composition to bring your eye through that image yeah. and the whole flow. So if you aren't in that position, like I, I've often said before, you know, if you're a seascape photographer and you're not getting wet, then you're a coastal photographer because you're on the cliffs, you're not a seascape. It's, <laughs> you know, be immersive. The water is so yeah. dynamic. And I, that's why I love seascape. And I think when we yeah. start looking at certain people's images, you can see, you have an image actually, one I think you use a thumbnail for the 1635 and you've got the flow of the wave coming all yeah. the way up through. And it's really, you're, so you're using the element as part of the composition which will never yeah. be repeated exactly the same again. And that's why you get a unique Completely image true, yeah. from, a, from a well-known location. So yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good to hear it as well. As yeah, from absolutely the, right about that. Yeah, I think it's good to hear from the whole competition point of view as well, because, you know, try and find an image that is unique and that is something that is different from the norm, even though it might be the norm. And I think that's where, yeah. um, you know, feelings, I think, really come into it. You know, when you're mm -hmm. taking the image, you have to be in connection, in my opinion, with, with nature, with Mother Nature, with the yeah. landscape and get that yeah. feeling. So how important do you think feelings are in uh, photography? feelings are everything in photography when we look at a photo if we don't feel anything from it we just pass it and then it's just who cares <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and and that is like for me I, I i have yet to make a video about it but it is something i talk about in my uh, in my big composition masterclass, mm -hmm. and that is relatability is everything mm. in mm. basically any kind of art not just landscape photography or photography in general. If the viewer cannot somehow relate to the photo, they just pass it and they don't care about it. Mm -hmm. So if you're only shooting for yourself, fine, then you should be able to relate to it. That is why I, for the most part, say to people that if they are only shooting for themselves, if, if they don't depend on a career within landscape photography, why bother thinking about what other people think about your photo? Of course, you can always like get help from others to figure out what you yourself appreciate and value in your photography. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you shoot for yourself. You are the one who's supposed to enjoy the photo hanging on your wall. Mm -hmm. um, but then there is also... As, as me, when, when I go out and photograph, I shoot for the most part for myself. And my business model is made up around me being able to photograph what I want to photograph. But if I was into stock photography or if I was into actually selling my landscapes, then there's also a market I need to take into consideration. Like mm -hmm. it would be the most stupid thing of me to go down to my local town here in Denmark and try to sell all my photos from Iceland because people yeah. cannot relate to photos from Iceland. Yeah. If I want to sell photos from Iceland, I should do it in Iceland to the tourists yeah. or to the locals. Then the same thing goes with if I want to sell photos from Denmark, then I should do it to the locals from that area because they relate much more to it than some person from the US who have no connection to Denmark whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So when it comes to feelings, obviously, we can also edit the photos in a way where we really bring out the feelings and how it was in that location um and maybe some people can relate to that uh, but for the most part i find that the people who are interested in buying my photos and buying my prints they can somehow relate to that location they have either gone there themselves or it's a, a local area uh, mm -hmm. that that means something for them yeah and you know something that comes to mind from that as well is that as the photographer when you look back at that image a year down the line, two years down the mm -hmm. line, you're immediately transported back to how you were feeling at that time. Was yeah. it warm? Was it cold? Was it windy? Were you comfortable? Mm. Were you in a rush? Were you nice and relaxed? You know, and for the viewer to take that image as well, they're not going to have the same feelings that you had, but they may do because it will remind them of certain time that they may have been there or they may have seen mm. that. And it floods back memories and feelings from that point of view. So I think visual yeah. Uh, ph photography is a visual skill. Um, it's yep. like painting is an example. Okay. So like I could take an image and I go, that's my best image. And you may not like mm. it because you've got no connection to that. Whereas exactly, I could have yeah. an image yeah, and I could have an image and I go, ah, it's meh. And you go, no, that's an absolute phenomenal image because it appeals to you for whatever reason. So there's the yeah. photographer's feelings and there's also mm. the viewer's feelings. And I think the winner exactly. winner is, when the two are aligned in the middle and that's when you get an absolutely incredible uh, image, I think overall. Yeah. Yes. And those photos are very, very hard to come by. You don't do that every day. And, and no, obviously the different peoples relate to different photos for different reasons. I, uh, in, in my recent uh, video about rural photography and in the end, I show two photos of the completely same subject, almost same composition but and the weather was the, almost the same but the lighting was very very different mm -hmm. uh, of a lone tree in in a big uh, weed field mm -hmm. and 
I have asked when, when I put it up on Facebook, I put it up on uh, Instagram and I've even put it in my Instagram stories for where people could vote, which one of them they like the mm-hmm. most. I put it into like a, a forum for Danish photographers and it is next to nearly 50, 50 with which yeah. one photo people like the most. Yeah. And it is so interesting to hear their reasons for it because there is like a really great composition is one in one of them with the tree in the lower third that's mm-hmm. a classic rule of third build up but mm-hmm. but uh, the tree in the lower left uh, and then a little cloud in the upper right uh, of the intersection points and it is such a strong composition but then one was like yeah, i really don't like it because of the cloud <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> You can't, you cannot satisfy everyone. It is impossible. And we photographers, obviously when we get into photography, we learn a lot of the different things we have to value in photography for different reasons. I made a video about that also last year, uh, like 10 different values in landscape photography. There's probably more. Mm -hmm. And, and, And we are just different human beings. Like we have different backgrounds we value different things like some photographers they don't give a rats about touristy travel landscape photographs uh, which which i'm doing a lot whereas they only value it if it has some kind of like environmental uh, mm-hmm. impact uh, of, or, mm-hmm. or value behind it uh, mm-hmm. so yeah it's different. I'm not sure what you asked it, about again. I completely forgot. No, no, but that, no, that, that was exactly it. I mean, the importance of feelings and the difference that people can have in it. And it's interesting you yeah. say about the, you know, putting a poll up on Instagram. I saw that poll. I voted for the one that had the light and, you know, because yeah. it was brighter for me. And then I know even I've done similar on my own Instagram where I might have two images and I go, I'm not sure which one I prefer. I'll put it up there. It's 4951. Mm. Always. Yeah. It, 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 it always blows me away because I kind of go, okay, what's, what should it be? And also I've taken some ideas. Actually, I've seen you do in the past is, you know, which thumbnail should I use for my next video? And mm. I get 50, 50 again. And I'm like, ah, why, why did I ask? Because I'm in the same position yeah. as I was beforehand, you know, that kind of way. So, yeah, but, yeah, but, but I guess that's exactly why we ask about it because we have arguments for both. Right. So yeah. I, I guess yeah. it's the same because I do the thing with the thumbnails too. And yeah. sometimes it, it's like 70 30, but for the most part, it's almost 50 50. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. All right. So um, the next thing I suppose I want to ask you is um, you know, again, I, I've seen a huge progression in your photography. And we've already covered this in the first part and how it's evolved mm-hmm. and such like that. So if you were to give the advice to somebody who wanted to be able to level up, their photography. Now, of course, one bit of advice besides purchasing your fabulous ebooks and such and courses, but outside of that, what advice would you give to somebody who would like to say, I want to level up my photography? What should they do? Learn from others. Good Go point. on YouTube, watch a ton of photography vlogs. That's how I improve. I, yeah. I and, and, and go to Instagram. Uh, a, a lot of people bitch about social media for various reasons. But one thing that is very positive about social media is you can get so much inspiration from there. And and you can fairly easily figure out what it is you prefer or not. I usually mm-hmm. tell people, like, make a mood board, go into, I don't know, 500 pixels and save photos into a folder that you like the most. Study those photos, figure out why it is you relate so much and respond so much to those photos and then figure out how you, if, it, if they're heavily on processing, figure out how you can process the photos like that, figure out how you can get those conditions um, and, and study it, learn the theory, go out and practice it. Learn from what you have been out practicing, evaluate on it, and then improve like that. It, it is a completely normal way for every human being to learn no matter what skill it is we want to improve it mm. takes time there's the theory part where you take in a lot of information you go out you practice it and then you evaluate on it and take that into consideration and next time you go out you have learned something new and then so it goes in a positive circle and it takes time it yeah. just takes time there's this uh, this book where where they talk about how uh, top athletes 
they become top athletes or whoever who has a talent. It's called talent is overrated. Mm -hmm. And it basically states that whatever skill it is you want to learn, it takes about 10,000 hours Mm -hmm. and then you master it. Obviously, Mm -hmm. there can be some physical hindrances for you. Like if you only have one leg, it's very, very hard to become the best at running 100 meters in the world. Yeah. Yeah. But besides that, for the regular normal human being, if you put in about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, then you can become what they define as masterful at whatever it is you do. And it's the same with landscape photography. I've been doing this for full time for almost 10 years ish mm. so i have i am close to those ten thousand hours mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. if people only use t- two hours a week on landscape photography then it takes Uh-oh. many more years yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. it's more a question I- about the amount of hours and deliberate practice you put into it more than than it's something you have had a interest for for 30 years uh, do you know what? I think the other side of it as well is you're spot on. It's fantastic advice, you know, to go learn from others, but also go learn with others. And I think yeah. that's another thing aspect of it. You know, since again, you were last on, I'd seen that you've done a number of different collaborations. One, I think not long after we were on, actually, you went to uh, Iceland with Nick Page. Um, and I think, you know, being with other people and collaborating with other people, it helps everybody to improve because you get a mind yeah. hive or a hive mind situation where you can learn from some, oh, I never thought of this. And you're there in the field and they can learn from you. So like, how have you found collaborations? I know in the the last year and year and a half, there hasn't been that many because of COVID and such like that. But how have you found, you know, working with others and even going forward because you've got a couple of collaborations as well that are coming up. So talk to me about your thoughts on collaborating with others. Well, it's it's super interesting, of course, because you get into their way of thinking. Uh, of course, with Nick, it, it was the Faroe Islands. We Faroe, we sorry, to, yeah, apologies. Yeah, yeah, we 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 had a we had two workshops back to back. But obviously, when when he is uh, talking to people about how he approaches a scene, he may might see something that I didn't see. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I've been to that location before and I'm telling them, this is what I do, this is what I did, and then you can do this and this and this. Uh, so so in that way, you're like, oh, getting a new perspective. I didn't think about doing that. And it, it kind of Good gets point. you out of your regular way of thinking. So mm-hmm. obviously it broadens your own spectrum that you remember next time. Oh, sh- maybe I should look for a little puddle where I can get a reflection. Um, is that something I want? Is that something I actually like? Uh, and and yeah, so so in that way, it, it it's super interesting. And it's the same with the uh, with Nigel. We went to Iceland together, uh, and and we're, we're together for only like four days. And we've also been to the Faroe Islands. And the thing about I really enjoy with with Nigel is that he doesn't seem to spend a whole lot of time on the social media looking at others. Mm. So photo so he's not as influenced about what is a great composition in like the famous locations mm-hmm. so so for the most part he actually ends up getting something which is like semi unique um, it's mm-hmm. still like a an iconic location we we go to photograph but uh, he usually get a fairly unique composition in most places so so that is also interesting to see how how he works uh, it mm. out and it's the same with myself like you you go and you experiment you try something out you get some inspiration from one photographer who did one thing in one Mm -hmm. location and you're like oh i can apply that to this location because that is actually what i want from that location Mm -hmm. Uh, especially the past two years we have talked about what it is how i also have uh, developed my own photography but one of the things that i feel because i've been shooting so much wide angle that I often lose the sense of scale. And that is actually something that I really appreciate from landscape photographs is just how big nature is. Yeah. So I have been photographing much, much more with the long lens and doing a lot more perspective compression uh, with my photos. So you get a better sense of how big uh, the, the world around us actually is. Mm. Um, mm. And that is something I've started to apply a lot to uh, to especially my travel photography also a little bit to my danish photography but mostly my travel photography 
And, you know, you mentioned it there as well, I think, about learning from others. And the best way to learn from others is in the field and on a workshop as an example. So, you know, yeah. like you, you go to the Faroes, you go to Iceland and such like that. So, like, tell me, I suppose, overall, you know, when we think about workshops, right, um, mm. you haven't had any workshops in the, the, the last year and a half per se, but you have some that are I, I have done so, a, one actually. Oh, have you? We did manage oh. to get to the Faroe Islands last autumn. <laughs> oh, you but did? it was Sorry. just like, oh, it, it was so hard. Like, it, it was uh, three Scandinavian people, one from Norway, one from Sweden, one from Denmark, and then one guy from England who managed to get out before they closed down. So it's just wow. like, oh, we managed. <laughs> like two <laughs> days that was, before the workshop started. That, that, wow, that was lucky. That was the trip, I think, you got actually of an image where there's a road, I think it's a curvy road. On, is that what that, that workshop? Uh, yeah, that it, it wasn't from that trip, but ah, yeah, okay, we went there. Yeah, so what's coming up from a workshop point of view? What can people expect now from you over the next coming months? And, and hopefully, when we can kind of still continue to be able to travel. So, where are you off yeah, to in the next couple of months? Given that's an option, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. then, uh, well, uh, I haven't all, all the workshops uh, that I have planned. Uh, workshops that we were pushed from 2020. So I have a, a, a week in the Faroes in the start of October with Nigel, Brilliant. and then a couple of weeks with uh, Nick Page uh, in December in the Faroe Islands. And then we have the Antarctica tour uh, with Nigel and uh, yeah. James Pupsis, the big one. Adam Gibbs, yeah. and Ellen Wall Wall Wallace, and uh one more i'm so sorry i can't remember Tom, thomas <laughs> um, heaton is thomas going on that no as well, no he? no he, he he's uh, running his his own tour with uh, ah, it's a uh, different one yeah okay yeah yeah and uh yeah and hopefully i i can do like a week in patagonia for myself when when i'm oh, actually wow. down there on the other side of the earth that would be nice That'd be uh, and then i have a couple i have one tour with uh, Sam MLT's landscape photographer uh, to Tuscany in Italy next nice. May. And then we have one for the Dolomites in all July slash August. Uh, nice. And that's it for my plans for workshops. Uh, I have tried to tone them down quite a lot because I've actually enjoyed not having to do workshops all the time, which I did in 2019. Mm -hmm. I was in Iceland like so much did the same tour so much and i just i was at a point where it's like okay this is li a little bit too much of mm -hmm. uh, of the same stuff mm -hmm. and that was mm -hmm. also where my my passion for exploring and photographing in denmark really exploded because there's only so many times that you can go to the ice beach e even though i enjoyed each time i'm actually there mm -hmm. it, it does become a little bit the same again and again and again like i also want to do something new and something mm. original <laughs> mm. well you, iceland has given you a whole new thing now to photograph which is the volcano in iceland i'm sure that's something that you yeah, have a big you draw to it yeah i know Still. it's changing so often now it, it reached the sea i think um a couple of weeks back i believe so there's a whole Almost different area from, yeah from what i know yeah yeah so i mean is iceland something that you want to go back to for the for the volcano do you want to go do that uh yeah well i just saw that nigel was up there this summer and it's almost impossible getting to the volca volcano now unless you use a drone um okay. sadly i would have wanted to go there earlier but due to covid i i hadn't got my vaccine and i couldn't mm -hmm. afford spending five days in isolation mm -hmm. um so yeah, if, let's say next time. But yes, I really I do want to go back to Iceland. There's so many more remote locations uh, mm -hmm. in the West Fjords and in the East Fjords mm -hmm. that I really want to photograph um, that I haven't been to, and I really want to go with my girlfriend uh, because we have she has a big interest for like she's studying Vikings uh, and, okay. and has a big interest for Iceland. We've both, both been to Iceland uh, many times, but we haven't never been there together. So that is actually, we wanted to nice. do that this August here, but uh, yeah, all sorts of like private things uh, yeah. happened uh, on yeah. her front. So she couldn't go. So, so it was, uh, yeah, just not possible. Uh, hopefully I can do some traveling in September, but Good. Uh, Again, it depends on on so many factors. <laughs> it does. And you know what? Speaking of, you know, personal trips and such like that and traveling in September, I've been saying to you for years, you got to come to Ireland. So like even from the whole coastal point of view, you know, with mountains, with lakes and such like that and woodlands, I think there's a huge mm -hmm. amount to explore here in Ireland. So 
there is a possibility, I believe, that you might be coming to Ireland in September. Fingers crossed that it will be because, you know, I'd love for you to see what we have here. I'd love for you to experience yeah. the, the, the Atlantic because, um, you know, I think I've shown you a couple of images there of the islands that are off the coast in Dingle and they're absolutely mm. phenomenal. Like you talk about, you know, Lord of the Rings worlds. This yeah. is Lord of the Rings worlds. This is yeah, just... Yeah, Ireland is very, very far up there on... on a list I want to do uh, and hopefully hopefully it will be possible uh, I, I dare not say uh, right yeah. now as of <laughs> recording this podcast whether it's possible but uh, hopefully that is fingers crossed that is the one thing I will be able to do this year which is not a workshop yeah, so yeah, yeah. Fing- fingers crossed we get you over here so yeah. Maz it's been absolutely fantastic catching up with you i've really enjoyed hearing all the things that have happened since you've last been on and you've given some phenomenal tips as well i think for our listeners and our viewers because we're doing this on video as well to be able to see visual representation of the stories that you have um been telling us so in case somebody doesn't know how to find any information on you where can people find information on you well uh, you can just google my name mess peter iverson iverson not iverson uh, mm-hmm. And then I will just pop up everywhere, you know, like YouTube, Instagram, my homepage. Uh, there's probably a link somewhere underneath in the description here. I will sure have links uh, there. Yeah. Yeah. So Instagram, YouTube, um, my homepage. <laughs> that, that's that's what it is. <laughs> well, I'll I'll flood the the show notes with all the different links, the socials, and Perfect. websites, and then stuff like that. It's been like I say. An absolute fantastic conversation. Thank you very, very much for taking the time to come on and talk. I know you're very, very busy. And hopefully, hopefully we'll get to see you at some stage anyway. Maybe in September, but if not, you know, time will be there. Ireland will always be there. And our wild Atlantic coast will always be there waiting for you as well. So for me in I Ireland, to you. Well, you're you're welcome. And we've got a phrase in Ireland. It's it's our our, our native language, which is Cade Mila Falcha, which means 100,000 welcomes. And there's 100,000 oh. welcomes for for you no problem whatsoever and you know I, I, if you're coming over it make sure you let me know in advance i'll try and make myself available as well to kind of give you areas to go to because i think you will be blown away by what we have in our little hidden gem here on the coast of uh, of the atlantic on the edge of europe yeah but it's it's phenomenal what we have here so yeah it's been an yeah. absolute pleasure thank you very very much for coming on and uh until the next time from me slonga fall Thank you so much and thank you uh, yeah, for the welcome and uh, yeah, thank you for again having me on the podcast. It was uh, very much enjoyable. It always is. So uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, buddy. Cheers. Hey guys, if you dig what you're hearing, why don't you jump over to iTunes, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five star rating and don't forget to share with your friends. With all that done, we'll see you next week. And remember, keep shooting.